I think we all agree that data is crucial for the economy and for the efficiency of all the sectors. Also, the current situation shows the potential of analytics and potential of how to use data for good, as was stated in, in the interview. Uh, I must admit that the attendance uh, at this conference exceeded our expectations. We have now more than 350 attendees watching us both on the Zoom platform and via Facebook streaming. Uh, it is much more than during our last year CyberSec Brussels Forum, which was uh, held in the Microsoft Conference Center, where we always held our conferences in the past. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your engagement. And uh, now we are moving to the next panel discussion, uh, which was uh, organized with uh, the support of the EXO Women for Cyber Initiative. Uh, the panel's aim will be to discuss the strength of cyber diplomacy, how all the initiatives, both top down and bottom up, can contribute to the global cybersecurity cooperation and inspire the international community. Uh, I am happy to welcome four exceptional women. Marina Kaljurand, member of the European Parliament, former chair of the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace. Heli Tirmaklar, ambassador at large for cyber diplomacy at the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Carmen Gonzalez, UNGG member and head of international cyber policy at the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Liga Rosenthal, Director of EU Governmental Affairs for Cybersecurity Policy and Security of Emerging Technologies at Microsoft. The session will be moderated by Luigi Rebuffi, Secretary General and founder of the European Cybersecurity Organization. Luigi, the floor is yours. Thank you and uh, good afternoon, everybody from uh, Paris. So it's afternoon in Paris. The confinement. Um, thank you, everybody, and congratulations, really, uh, to Isabella and her team for all what you're doing is really incredible. How you managed to set up quickly and with uh, great efficiency and success this conference. So, um, I nevertheless, I would say to Isabella that she was uh, she gave me to moderate this panel, the chance to to moderate this panel on cyber diplomacy. Uh, maybe because I'm a technical person and uh, close to uh, to industry. So maybe she said, she thought that maybe if I manage to understand something on cyber diplomacy, maybe everybody will understand uh, all what is going on. Um, in this panel, we tried to, we will discuss several main topics, somehow in a chronological order as they appeared. First of all, we will deal with cyber diplomacy. Uh, then we will look at the, uh, the UN process on group of governmental experts on advancing responsible state behavior in cyberspace and the other group on open-ended working group on developments in the fields of ICTs. We will also look at, look at the Paris Call on Trust and Security in Cyberspace and at the Council Initiative on Restrictive Measures to Deter and Respond to Cyber Attacks. As I said, we have four uh, very important women um, which are also linked, uh, closely linked to our initiative on Women for Cyber. And I really thank you for being available today at this discussion. Uh, I also added to the topics proposed by the organizer, a couple of more topics uh, to, to, to where you can intervene, about the impact of all this, um, let's say cyber diplomacy and, and, and uh, discussion. What is the impact on the citizen and the economy? Because sometimes, it could look, they are very theoretical topics, very high level, but I think we have to bring it down, especially I saw it following closely the Paris call. We have to bring it down to real life, to, to strong messages to the economy, to the industry. And this in this period is very, very important that we, we show it. And also, as we are for women, they say, what is the women contribution in all this dialogue? I, I saw there's a lot of uh, women which are cyber ambassadors, uh, we need women in also all the other sectors, and I would appreciate also to have your comments. So the discussion will be developed uh, in several interventions. Um, I asked you to intervene in more than one, if possible, of these topics. Each intervention should be of the order of five minutes. So let's see if we manage to switch from one to the other. And um, we start with cyber diplomacy. So Eli, maybe you can kick off the panel. Thank you.
Eli, we cannot hear you. We cannot hear you, Eli. Can you hear me now? Yes. You can hear me, good. Um, can you see me? Absolutely, very well. Good. Tere. Uh, I am very glad to uh, uh, start off the a panel on cyber diplomacy because um, actually, as Luigi knows and, and, uh, and, and many colleagues know uh, who might be online, uh, I was working at the External Action Service of the European Union when the European Union um, uh, issued the first Council conclusions on cyber diplomacy in 2015. And the rationale for the um, uh, Council conclusions for cyber diplomacy at that time was to raise the profile of the issue of cyber diplomacy and also to make sure that there is a common European approach uh, combining um, on several issues of cyber diplomacy, uh, starting with um, state behavior, uh, normative um, uh, elements and normative frameworks uh, for um, state behavior, also how international law applies in cyberspace and how the uh, countries can cooperate for a more stable and secure cyberspace. Secondly, the cyber diplomacy also encompasses a very important um, field of internet governance because, as we know, internet is a uh, connecting platform for all of us. Uh, and we are um, now reaching um, uh, 4.5 mil billion internet users uh, in 2020 uh, around the globe. And there are 26 billion devices connected to the internet. So. This um, uh, rapid increase of uh, the usage of internet and the connectivity is uh, calling for very clear rules of the road when we talk about the behavior um, in cyberspace, not just by the governments, but also by the um, civil society actors, by the private sector companies and all by, also by the individual um, users. So, uh, as this is uh, still a new domain where um, we are um, mostly thinking in terms of economic progress, social development, um, uh, there are few countries in the world that have appointed cyber ambassadors and are dealing also with the more comprehensive threat picture for cyber issues. Um, but um, uh, all in all, we are um, still in the face that we are uh, seeing mostly um, the uh, internet and cyberspace as um, um, something very positive and progressive. And I think this needs to be staying like this because we should not um, overdo the threat uh, narrative and we should not really uh, only talk about um, security issues and the threat issues in cyberspace, but we certainly have to talk about the responsibility of all the actors and uh, about the multi-stakeholder nature of cyberspace. And also we have to all think what we, uh, each of us, uh, can do in order to uh, make cyberspace more uh, secure and stable. And I think cyber diplomacy is something that reaches from the top to town, like from the governmental behavior, uh, what we discuss in the UN, group of governmental experts, uh, Carmen and I will be sitting there again, hopefully soon. Um, then um, we discussed that uh, in NATO, in the EU, in OSCE, in all the multilateral formats. Um, but um, we also discussed the very um, issues of trust and security in digital space um, in a much more a broader environment, in a multi-stakeholder environment. And there, uh, the private sector companies have a role, the civil society actors have a role, and, and each of the netizens has a role as well, because uh, trust and security in cyberspace is something everybody can contribute to. And... Um, uh, uh, we, 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 of course, know that the um, uh, uh, European Union has done quite uh, many efforts and serious efforts in order to raise awareness of all its organizations and citizens on cybersecurity issues. Um, but it's not enough if we just do it in Europe. So we have to also reach outside. We also have to reach to the regions outside of European Union and make sure that uh, uh, Africa, Asia, Latin America, and, and the less developed regions in the world in terms of technology should also start um, understanding the challenges we have uh, with um, this uh, reliance on the technology. And, and we also have an um, obligation to help them. And the European Union uh, has been a front runner in these issues of, uh, of capacity building as well, together with European countries, including um, Estonia and the others. 
Uh, also quite importantly, what cyber diplomacy is about is um, the notion that um, freedom as uh, it applies offline should apply online. So the freedom of expression, um, freedom of association, also uh, all the people should have access to information as uh, so a first freedom, of course. So this uh, internet freedom aspect is something very important when we discuss cyber diplomacy. And Estonia, together with many other countries, um, uh, is a part of the Freedom Online Coalition, where we are discussing the aspects of um, uh, what shall we do in terms of uh, uh, increasing um, the internet freedom um, globally and uh, making sure that um, all the countries uh, can also enjoy the same rights and all the citizens of all the countries can enjoy the same rights online as they should enjoy offline. Um, and quite importantly, what you, what you ask, Luigi, what actually does cyber diplomacy mean for economy? And I, I understand totally <laughs> this uh, question because sometimes the diplomats are living in their own bubble and they talk about um, so the issues like state responsibility and what are the wrongful international acts. I just would like to sh uh, show the link, which is very clear and uh, present. When uh, we are experiencing a major uh, uh, cyber attack, a global one, like we had, for instance, a couple of years ago, WannaCry and NotPedia. Economic aspect was uh, uh, quite uh, significant. So we had the whole sectors um, not being able to function for weeks because of these ransomware attacks. Um, the economic loss is uh, huge. We, we still have very differing numbers, what exactly, for instance, NotPedia meant for economy. But the numbers are ranging from seven to 10 billion uh, euros globally. So this is a huge number. And it were mostly the um, private sector companies, small businesses, uh, medium-sized businesses that got hit with this global ransomware attack. And um, uh, uh, if we, the governments, do not react to this kind of um, uh, malicious behavior organized or sponsored by the uh, nation states in cyberspace, then I think our economy will, will suffer even graver losses in the future. And that's why it's important that um, we, the, um, all the like-minded governments, European Union governments, we, we react to this kind of um, reckless behavior in cyberspace. And uh, there is an EU mechanism that we call EU Cyber Diplomacy Toolbox, which uh, has been uh, discussed uh, and um, also already approved in 2017, but as a follow-up to this uh, first document in 2019, uh, the EU has um, adopted the um, EU cyber sanctions regime. And, uh, and now we are in a process of implementing this regime. And I think this is very important to um, continue uh, the European Union work on a response uh, to malicious cyber activities, because um, we should send a very clear message that our economy and our uh, political um, uh, uh, systems depend also on the um, functionality of cyberspace and we do not tolerate uh, if this will be disrupted by state actors. Of course, if there are criminal actors, we can um, always uh, rely on the uh, criminal legislation and, um, and uh, we have very good fight against cybercrime in, in the European Union. There is a EU fight uh, legislation already in, in order to fight uh, against cybercrime. But um, <clears throat> when we talk about cyber diplomacy, we do not talk about cyber crime, but mostly the actors that are um, the high end uh, actors, the state actors, uh, state sponsored actors, uh, state supported actors. And, um, and we are calling for all the states to uh, behave responsibly in cyberspace. This is what the cyber diplomacy is about. Thank you. Thank you, Eli. Marina, do you want to to have a quick intervention here on this cyber diplomacy issue as a member of the European Parliament. Uh, well, thank you, Luigi. I'll do it with pleasure. But first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for doing the conference. And I'm very privileged to be on the panel with my very good friends. Hi, Heli, hi, hi, ladies. And if you hear some barking, these are my corona happy dogs who are used to long walks. So please, I'd like, I'd like also to apologize for that. Uh, Hilly mentioned all important points. What I'd like to add to that is that uh, cyber diplomacy and cyber incidents show that we need cooperation. We need cooperation internally with all stakeholders. We need cooperation 
externally international cooperation. Starting with bilateral agreements we have with different countries, but also going up to EU, Haley mentioned EU, Haley mentioned United Nations. What I think is important is that we have to be very realistic and we have to know what we can achieve where, in which forum. I have had the privilege of serving in the UNGG, so I understand that the GG process, or let's say the United Nations process, most probably will not be able to agree to, to any uh, looking into the future, binding instruments, uh, decisions, even norms, because we're so divided in the United Nations by the concepts or views of ICTs of what cyber can bring to the lives of our people. So UN has its role, uh, awareness raising, education, capacity building, but let's not hope that we'll be able to go to continue with attribution or any measures of response against those who violate international law. In the United Nations, we can't even continue our work on applicability of international law because of so different views. And here comes the regional level. So I think that where we can make progress is exactly EU, as Haley mentioned. Uh, I can't say that I was very happy when I saw the first piece of attribution by the council. Uh, it was 20, uh, 2015, 2016, Haley, please correct me. But it was the first thing to do. It was a collective attribution and has to be recognized as that. So now I'm really looking forward. How will EU continue the application of the uh, cyber diplomacy toolbox in the present situation where we see that even, du even during the coronavirus, cyber attacks are happening and maybe even happening more than previous, during previous weeks. So I, 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 I I'd urge us to be realistic to know uh, which organization can do what. And I, uh, I'm never tired of stressing how important is cooperation in this field. Thank you, Marina. Well, you covered somehow several topics of this panel at the same time, but we will go now a little bit deeper in, in one of them, which is the, um, um, which is dealing with, with the U, uh, UN process that you mentioned that you have been member. Uh, Carmen is, uh, is, a, is already a member of the GG. Um, we also have to tackle uh, the, the, the other working group, which is uh, open-end working group, which is more open also, not only to a selected number of, uh, of, uh, of state. So um, the question is to you, uh, Carmen, how, how you how we can harmonize this conversation? Marina said it's very challenging to converge. Uh, how can we move on? And and also, I have um, let's say studying and preparing this panel. I had a question because uh, which is linked to what we were discussing before with Ellie. How we can uh, bring the, the the interest and and the, and the voice somehow of the of the other stakeholders, not only of the public sector. Um, I know that is not possible in GGE, but maybe in the in the open uh, uh, in the open-ended working group that could be possible. Please, Carmen. Thank you, Luigi, and thank you for uh, being uh, our uh, phenomenal uh, moderator today. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, it's okay. a bit breaking, a... but it's okay. All right, um, and thank you to the organizers. Uh, like uh, others have uh, said already, uh, it's obvious that um, this corona crisis reminds us of the um, incredible importance of the availability, integrity and confidentiality of our digital connectivity. And that we also uh, are more and more aware now of, of um, the fact that it is uh, under threat and even more so, in, unfortunately, in these times of crisis. I think it's really uh, very, very unfortunate that we are witnessing this increase of attacks and uh, uh, or even aiming at, at hospitals and other public health uh, institutions, um, be it uh, conducted by criminals or perhaps there are also state actors behind it, I don't know, but it's really definitely very um, uh, unfortunate. I understand that my connection is unstable. I hope that you hear me. Um, yes, so please go on. This also, um, Yes, 
I understand that this also, of course, um, uh, is um, a, a very, very uh, important um, reminder of the importance of international cooperation. And um, uh, in that respect, although the UN process um, uh, is a challenging one because we have to, uh, in the UN, we have to agree uh, reach consensus with 193 countries. That's not easy in the open-ended uh, working group, for example. Um, and of course, apart from uh, states, there are very many other actors uh, that are playing a very important role in our digital uh, world. Uh, not only the private sector, but uh, also the technical community, uh, uh, academia uh, and um, uh, civil society. And we have to bring those voices um, have to connect those voices to the discussion as well and make them be heard. But uh, even though, um, and notwithstanding the challenges in the UN process, I think it is also more and more important. And um, fortunately, what I'm witnessing at the moment, um, uh, at least during the last round of, of, of conversations in the GTE that took place before the outbreak of the crisis in Europe, the Corona crisis, um, I noticed that there is, um, I think, still hope um, and there is the perspective of finding a common denominator, uh, building on the results of the previous GGEs, building on the important notion that international law as it stands is applicable in cyberspace and that we should um, uh, work together to find to agree on guidance and on, 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 on how, on answering the question, how it applies in all circumstances and build on the, the, the norms that we have, these this 11 foundational norms that we have agreed upon in 2015 in the GGE. Foundational norms like do not attack each other's critical infrastructure in peacetime. I think that it's absolutely, um, this crisis also um, uh, highlights the, the, the very importance of that important norm. And uh, we should uh, uh, elaborate more on how this norm applies, on, on, uh, on what we do together to um, internationally as states to monitor uh, its, its implementation and abidance uh, to that rule. And we can do so by means of, inter of, of, of diplomatic cooperation like we do in Europe, for example, in the framework of this uh, toolbox, Europe, uh, EU cyber diplomacy toolbox. However, uh, what I wanted to uh, highlight is that um, in relation to the UN process is that although it's challenging, there is, I think, a perspective of uh, trying to plow ahead. Um, uh, that's at least my feeling in the open-ended working group. Uh, a text, uh, a draft is on the table now. Um, uh, so all the um, representatives of, of the UN states are studying. So, so even with the with the, the current uh, in, uh, pause in uh, um, we are witnessing in internet in multilateral negotiations. Fortunately, behind the scenes, um, countries are working on these important questions, and um, uh, so I'm I'm hopeful. Uh, that um, in July, if hopefully the, 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 the last meeting of the Open Ended Working Group will take place as foreseen, uh, there is a basis for a consensus report. And I think I would like to appeal to everybody's um, sense of responsibility. However, I think it's also um, that all, um, I'm, a, I'm a diplomat, I'm a professional uh, optimist, of course, and, um, and I want to maintain that optimism. But that being said, of course, there are several challenges um, that we um, cannot um, ignore. And there are these very stark differences of approach to the internet, to the governance, uh, governance of, of the digital world uh, that can even become more, more um, notable, uh, notable in these times. Um, when we talk about uh, the divide between countries that have a liberal, liberal democratic view of the internet, uh, internet covered by all the stakeholders involved and, and firmly based in, um, on, on the applicability of, of, of human rights um, obligations uh, in, in, in internet, uh, in the digital world as well. 
um, vis-a-vis a more authoritarian view of the internet where uh, fundamental freedoms are definitely not as um, important um, as um, in our, now in, I think in Western, uh, in, in liberal democratic societies. Now, I noticed that, for example, uh, in the as such laudable efforts to cope with this horrendous crisis, uh, some governments are um, starting to use surveillance, um, um, cyber surveillance in a much more extensive manner, also uh, covering, uh, we should all be mindful of the fact that uh, crises sometimes require um, um, different um, approaches. However, we should uh, not forget that the balance between security and fundamental freedoms should be upheld. Um, and um, we should not go down the slippery slope of uh, not heeding uh, that important um, imperative. Thank you, Carmen. I think you you touched with the last word a very a challenge that we are facing these days because I really had the feeling on one end, Marina, a uh, call for cooperation, cooperation, and also you, you reminded that. But at the same time, we see that this crisis on one end is separate us physically, is getting together by a digital, but at the same time we see strong reaction for certain uh, countries or certain uh, persons which will go the opposite way, which are uh, maybe as a reaction of the fact that they simply want to, 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 keep, to be alive, to keep alive, that there is the risk that this crisis will, um, will, lead, will, uh, will bring us to a slippery slope, as you said, and which will really is the opposite of cooperation. And we need physical cooperation in, in exchanging all what we have available today to fight the, the virus and also uh, digital cooperation in establishing uh, a fight against these attacks that we have seen also these last days against health structure, which is a very criminal attacks. Uh, okay, now, um, Carmen, we will come back to you, but now I would like to, uh, to move on the Paris call. Marina, you, you, you have played a role, important role also on the Paris call, no? Uh, well, I can't say that I played important role on the Paris call, but yes, as the chair of the Global Commission on Stability and Cyberspace, I'm really proud that our commission was one of the first ones to join the Paris call. Why I think Paris call is very important and crucial. It's the first document which is really multi-stakeholder in its nature. Because where I see, as I said, there is an ideological division. We all say right things. We all say free and open internet. We all say, say public-private partnership and multi-stakeholder inclusiveness. But we mean differently. So Paris Call is extremely important in trying to get behind cyber stability and cyber security different stakeholders. Governments, civil society, academia, uh, technical community. Where are, what are the weaknesses of the Paris call? Unfortunately, we do not see big countries being members, still, being, uh, still joining the Paris call. Yes, it's Netherlands, yes, it's Estonia, yes, it's Finland, but we do not see Russia, China, United States, but these big powers, they have an important role in all aspects of security, including cybersecurity. So I see it as a very good first step. I, I think that United Nations should take, uh, should look into Paris call more seriously and take it as a basis. I agree with Carmen that we have to be optimists. Carmen is a diplomat, I'm not. I'm a former foreign minister. I can, maybe I can be much more open, but come on guys. Even the mandate of the GG was changed because we are not ready to discuss applicability of international law. We are not ready to discuss it in a forum. We, are, we agreed to having state submissions, which is a step back from what we did in 2015, 2017. So I'd urge uh, other, all stakeholders once again to look into Paris call, those who have not acceded yet to accede it, 
and in preparation of the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, it would be really great to have a global document where all stakeholders agree on some concrete steps, even if they are not legally binding, even if it's just a political document. Thank you, Marina. Um, as EXO, as Secretary General of EXO, I have the pleasure to say that we also were among the first to adhere to this um, initiative. But I know that Microsoft uh, was really one of the first uh, supporter of this, and Liga also is very strongly intervening in all the different events of the Paris call. So Liga, maybe as representative in this panel from the private sector, maybe you can tell us more what you do and how you see this, the different initiatives also, especially from the private sector, the economy, and the importance to, to join the Paris call also for those who are not Good strictly... Good afternoon. I'm not sure if you can hear me. My con yes. connection yes. is... <laughs> Go on. Okay, Liga. <laughs> no. Is Liga is disrupting? If you want Liga, you can go. Okay. In hopes that the connection uh, does does maintain, so that I can. Um, respond to the question. Uh, certainly, my has the ability to unite all multi-stakeholder uh, participants who, are, who have a very firm commitment to the nine principles of the Paris call. Uh, we think that the Paris call provides very good opportunities to do the global work on implementing the norms that have been addressed in very many forums, so that the daily work and the everyday work that doesn't make the big uh, political statements actually goes ahead on a regular basis, be addressed in a long-term manner so that we can engage over a thousand participants that have made this commitment to the nine principles or challenges that are addressed in the Paris call. I think that uh, from my role in a very strong base in Europe to address the challenges in the Paris call to address capacity building and confidence building. We've seen that, um, as Heli and Marina have already addressed, that the UN is very actively working, whether through the open-ended working group or the UNGGE to look at cyber globally. But I think one of the things that we can certainly encourage from the side of um, non-governmental, the non-governmental side, is that how can the Paris call be weaved into perhaps the open-ended working groups report to focus on it as a vehicle or a tool to bring the guidelines that will be coming out of the UN um, uh, into a form that can be implemented. For instance, if we have, um, if we address through the UN, the Paris call as the platform that could address capacity, how can we address capacity building through the nine chapters in the Paris call? And how can we also do that regionally so that we can address differences um, in global and what can we do between regions as well? And I think in various regions, there's different strength between the private sector, civil society and governments. And so you can address global issues from a, in a way that different regional perspectives can be taken into consideration. Right now, the work that uh, Microsoft is doing and, and many others on the various principles all can, of course, be seen on the French Foreign Ministry's website for the Paris call. And I'm happy to see that they had a consultation open on various areas of the Paris where they responded to those questions. And I hope many other uh, uh, also looked at that consultation. Microsoft actively works on uh, several of the principles, but I wanted to emphasize the work on uh, principle three, three, which is defending electoral processes. Um, but even before the Paris call, Microsoft has been looking at various impacts to democratic processes and how technology plays a role in those processes and how now we can work under the uh, umbrella of principle three to address together with the Alliance for Securing Democracy various aspects of work that can be done on defending electoral processes and also involving governments in this very closely. 
Additionally, we have, we're ongoing under the Tech Accord. Uh, the Cybersecurity Tech Accord is in the more than 100 uh, private sector companies want to address cybersecurity in an active and collaborative way. And we're working under the Paris call to address both uh, principle eight on private hack back and green and others. Um, one thing I do want to, uh, I'll go into if, if we have the time, is how we look at the current situation and how industry as one of the very active responders to a global crisis can learn in the future and how to apply it to cyber norms principles. So if there's time, we'll go into that as well. Please, um, I think maybe you, it's time now to go in. Liga. Okay, I'll go ahead and jump on uh, some of the, th the ideas on um, impact to citizens, citizens and economy from the viewpoint of industry. And while as the situation has developed with COVID-19 over the last few days, industry has had to play a very unique role, especially digital industry and how we can continue to support the economy in ways that was not necessarily foreseen during normal circumstances. And, you know, I think um, when you look at cybercrime, no good crisis goes without, uh, without um, no good crisis goes to waste. Well, we also don't want uh, to lessons that we can uh, in real time looking at this particular crisis and how we can, as first responders in one sense, also in this particular crisis, what we can learn. Reflecting on um, how one cry impacted the health system and structures were a part of that particular crisis. Uh, we also are looking now at how um, the combination of different crises plays out in the cyber spy cyberspace. We saw that the Brno Hospital was uh, also attacked by ransomware and what that meant to the healthcare sector, specifically during a healthcare scare and how we can address that and how that impacts citizens and economy. Combining that also with one of the EU tools for assessing the significant impact of cyber incidents and specifically how they impact digital service providers, we have the NIS directive. So if you look at how the NIS directive addresses significant impact of cyber attacks, you look at either geographical scope or the number of users affected or the duration of the incident when we combine that with the health um, health uh, crisis right now, we can try to um, define how we can reduce what is what is happening now in a crisis, so that we can take practical steps in the future. So I try to look at infrastructures and how we can. Liga, we lost you. When you're in a crisis or in a normal sort of situation, that can be um, addressed in a different way. I find it uh, a bit um, ironic that always in cybersecurity we talk about peacetime and wartime. I think that line between those two areas is definitely blurred during the current crisis. One of the things that we're also learning during this crisis is how we can use previous channels of communication to be able to um, help citizens and the economy. For instance, during the um, previous elections, industry has worked heavily together in order to detect either disinformation or cyber attacks that influence processes. We're using those channels to also address any cyber attacks or disinformation and the threat intelligence that needs to be shared between industry to try to best uh, react. So to protect either uh, the critical infras, the ends of customers, the digital industry has around the world to be able to address the issue um, on a daily basis. How this relates to norms is, is a bit, uh, norms seem to be something that we really have to develop over time, but we want to use the situation to learn how we can work when situa the situation becomes a bit more um, 
norm normalized so that a cyber attacks is run. Okay. Liga. It becomes a bit more um, norm normalized. Liga, you know, if you finished, because we, we had to connect the dots sometimes, um, the connection was not very good. I uh, suppose the organizer cut your video just to allow the, the voice to, to be less um, interrupted. So thank you for your contribution. I, so the, for the parties call, indeed, we have the principal one, which is the one which is very close, I suppose, to the to the citizens and infrastructure, which is to protect the individuals and the infrastructure these days. This is really what we need. We will feel very close with this uh, coronavirus issue. Um, the But these cyber attacks are continuing, as you mentioned, also on health structure and um, I was wondering when, how this is linked to, and can the council initiative of May 2019 to establish a framework allowing Europe to impose targeted restrictive measure to deter and respond to cyber attacks is applicable to not only to state actors uh, that has to follow or not follow cyber norms, but also to the whatever, whoever is producing the cyber attack. So maybe um, the, Carmen can say something about this. Thank you. I, I hope I'm still online because I can't see you anymore, but I can hear you. Okay, you're right? breaking sometimes, but we can see you. All right. Please okay. go on. Well, uh, thank you, Luigi. Thank you. Um, I think uh, we all agree that um, it's great that we agreed on the applicability of international law in cyberspace and on uh, 11 foundational norms of responsible state behavior. But having norms uh, is one thing, but uh, ensuring that they are uh, abided by and uh, fostering their implementation, that's very important because we don't want them to be paper tigers. So that's the reason why, um, in the first place, the EU uh, and its member states agreed in 2017 uh, based on uh, adherence to the uh, uh, UN uh, GG um, applies or, or provides um, a, uh, a range of instruments varying from instruments that can be um, applied um, on the lower end of the spectrum and but also supplying us with uh, instruments that can be used on the higher end of the spectrum when uh, there we are faced with more challenging uh, crises and attacks and we haven't been able to ensure uh, cooperation from uh, other from third states and parties um, with um, let's say more uh, with with means at the lower end of the spectrum. So and that's why uh, apart from uh, um, so the, 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 the to make it more concrete, the toolbox um, gives us the possibility to to issue, for example, statements to express concern uh, about uh, certain threats. But uh, if that doesn't help, and if we can't, a country that we think should, could help look for other means or to apply other means, and these are restrictive measures. Restrictive measures are um, uh, measures that are completely um, 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 condoned or are, that, are, that are acceptable under international law. They are, um, and they, they can, for example, be um, uh, imply the imposition of sanctions. And that's why the EU last year decided to, to operationalize those restrictive measures that were foreseen in the toolbox and agreed upon a, um, a framework for uh, uh, sanctions, cyber sanctions, a, a specific horizontal sanctions regime that um, provides with the possibility to um, impose uh, um, um, uh, travel restrictions, uh, travel uh, visa, uh, travel bans, and um, uh, asset freezes 
uh, on individuals or entities that are um, regarded to be a threat, um, a cyber threat to the European Union and its member states, to the security of the European Union and its member states. So it's important to underscore that the sanctions are not aiming at states, at third states, but they're aiming at entities or individuals that um, uh, the EU and its member states consider to be a threat. And uh, the sanctions regime is uh, also not meant to be a substitute for a criminal um, uh, investigation and uh, prosecution, because that's something different. The sanctions regime is not a punitive um, uh, arrangement. It is meant to prevent and to deter um, uh, cyber attacks on the European Union and its member states uh, in the framework of our common foreign and security policy. So I think that's a very important to, to underscore um, it, and to underscore that it's one of the tools that we have in this toolbox that has also other um, co more cooperative um, means um, provided that can help us to uh, tackle cyber threats. Okay, Carmen, just a question. Do you think that this prevention measure have got some effects or it's too early to say? Well, we have not yet um, actually uh, imposed sanctions uh, on uh, a particular actor. Um, but of course, the fact that we have the sanctions regime in place is hopefully also a sign, a signal that the EU is, is um, preparing itself to respond to anyone who tries to endanger uh, the security of the EU and its member states in cyberspace. So I think that the, the, we never know what we have deterred, of course, until now, because uh, that's very difficult to measure. But I'm pretty sure that, 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 that others will have noticed that this sanctions regime is in place and that they will perhaps hopefully think twice before they um, attack us and uh, um, violate uh, norms of international national law or norms of responsible state behavior uh, in cyberspace. So I, I hope that this will, this, I also hope that what we are doing as a European Union will is to, uh, work together um, with other responsible states to ensure that when, when they are attacked, they can um, have this, this particular uh, um, uh, answer, this particular instrument at their availability to ensure that um, we do spread this notion that um, it is not without a price. Uh, we have to increase the price of irresponsible behavior. And this is one of the tools that we have at, at our um, disposal to do so. And I hope that others will, will do so as well. Of course, I think for countries to, to act or to engage in um, restrictive measures, you do need a certain uh, capacity to cooperate internationally. That's why I think it's very important that we uh, together collectively invest in capacity building worldwide, that we help countries not only to defend themselves in cyberspace, because that will enable them to uh, uh, reap the benefits of digitalization, but it will also enable them to work together with other countries and to help together collectively to ensure responsible behavior. And that's what we are doing also. Um, that's why the EU itself is very active in capacity building worldwide um, and is also co cooperating with other uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives like the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise that is also working worldwide, uh, uh, definitely also in the Global South to up capacity, not only for countries to protect themselves, but also to cooperate internationally um, in order to uphold um, this normative framework, uh, this, this framework for responsible state behavior. Okay, Carmen, thanks. Um, simply a quick a quick intervention from Marina on this point that you are a Minister for Foreign Affairs. How do you see this, uh, this, this initiative, this, uh, this restriction measure uh, really applicable uh, or, or needed even? Uh, when, when you consider the problem of attribution, for instance? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, just a couple of points. First, there should not be difference between online and offline. If we are having sanctions or other restrictive measures for somebody who violates international law in real life, 
occupation of Crimea, then we should have also restrictive measures and sanctions towards those who are violating international law in internet. So there should not be difference between approaches of offline, online. Uh, as Carmen said, at the moment, it's a paper. But what we need, we need clarity. Because the bad guys, being the bad guys, governments or non-state actors, they are using the vague gray zones of international law at the moment as a playground. What they can do, how far can they go? Look, look what's happening in Ukraine. Ukraine is being used as a playground for, for, for bad guys. So we need clarity. This is not okay to do this. This is violates international law. If you violate international law, the following actions will follow. That's the clarity that we need very much. How can we get it? We can get it through concrete actions, actions of attribution, even political statements. If we can't agree in the EU on sanctions at the moment, and I see that we can't for different political reasons, at least at the moment, then even political statements are good where we as a, uh, as a community, as 27, express our view the same way as, for example, NATO collectively has done attribution. So it's important to have more clarity. More clarity, the better for everybody. Okay, thank you, Marina. So it's a legal issue, it's a political issue, but goes also to, let's say, to the society, a global issue. Um, now it's, um, we are close to the end. I, there was a question from the audience, which was asking to each one of you, if you could express some quick wins, I say to assist the developing world, but also I would say some quick wins of all the topics we have, we have discussed, uh, not only because for, for me, I mean, the, uh, we, we all are connected in the global uh, cybersphere. So uh, what could be for each one of you, one quick win, in all the, let's say, under this cyber diplomacy umbrella, umbrella with the different topics we discussed, the UN, the UN process, the Paris call, and, 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 um, and all these uh, initiatives. So maybe Marina, you start as you are on the screen. Uh, yes, uh, I'm happy to. Uh, if I have to say something, then for me, the, the word today is inclusiveness. Inclusiveness meaning different stakeholders discussing and participating in, in decision-making processes. Inclusiveness means also gender, but inclusiveness means also uh, assisting those who are maybe at the moment are not as capable or do not have enough capacities. And I'd like to draw your attention to the UN Secretary General's high level panel on digital cooperation, which I also had the honor to participate in, and its report, which pays, which pays a big attention to the notion of inclusiveness in all spheres. In all spheres. And second word for me today is human centeredness. When we look into the future, artificial intelligence, internet of things, we should remember that it, it is for humans. It has to serve humans and the final decision has to be made by humans. Thank you, Marina. Now, Eli, from one Estonian to the other, can you give your yes. point of view? What, which quick win? Would you take? Home? Yeah, uh, for me, uh, I think the most important point is always capacity building because uh, I see that there is a uh, great need for uh, um, awareness raising still uh, amongst maybe the uh, politicians and uh, leaders in the world on these issues. And secondly, uh, the capacity building uh, towards the developing nations uh, that are still looking for the right model of um, how to build the proper cyber system nationally how to become resilient, how to train their um, experts, and also uh, how to make sure that they have sustainable efforts. And I think the capacity building for me is the most important catchword in all of these uh, topics, uh, whether we speak about um, implementation of, uh, of the EU policies or, uh, or the UN cyber norms or, or other regional organizations' uh, efforts. So we have to make sure that um, each country in the world has a computer emergency response team. They have cyber crime uh, um, uh, units. They have legislation in place that allows them to investigate and prosecute cyber crime. And also there are, uh, there are the institutions and organizations in place so that if something happens globally, we can contact all countries in the world. So we don't have that yet globally. So 
That would okay. be my takeaway. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. Carmen. Thank you. Now, I completely agree with um, what Heli said about the capacity building. That's really crucial. Um, uh, at this moment, uh, less than 50% uh, of countries worldwide have, in fact, a, a computer emergency response uh, team uh, in, in their countries uh, and uh, have uh, a thorough um, cyber uh, security strategy based on a uh, multi-stakeholder so that when we think uh, that when we talk capacity building we uh, include all the stakeholders because there is no capacity building without uh, them on board um, uh, clearing houses that's that's definitely uh, of, of great um, uh, need, need, use at this moment I think and there's a great need for a clearing house uh, there is already a lot of work done in that regard, uh, and I would like to uh, highlight the work of the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise that has a, a public-private organization built, uh, constructed in, in 2015 that counts more than 115 members and partners, that's um, states, um, international organizations, uh, private uh, uh, partners, private sector partners, and civil society. Uh, collectively uh, trying to indeed ensure that there's matchmaking between demand and supply of uh, capacity uh, to ensure that uh, in, in 10 or uh, years time, 100% uh, of uh, countries worldwide have indeed a computer emergency response team, a proper cyber strategy, uh, well um, functioning awareness campaigns, um, uh, good um, uh, cyber security skills development uh, systems in place. That's what we're working at. And of course, and this, this is um, definitely an, an, uh, an aspect of campus building that has been highlighted also now with uh, uh, in the framework of the UN process is uh, um, capacity building aiming at um, enfor uh, reinforcing diplomatic um, way in which we can ensure cyberspace based on international law without uh, proper international cooperation there diplomats have to play a crucial role okay thank you Carmen we managed to hear at the very end. Uh, Liga, a very quick one before, because time is almost over. Your quick win. Yes, my quick win, I think, would be to address diversity in finding solutions. If you look at having worked in government, civil society, and industry on cybersecurity, I would say there is no one-size-fits-all solution globally to any one particular problem. So in trying to ad address the challenges in cyber norms or cybersecurity more in general, we should look to where there is more impact and who is the best actor or tool to implement a solution, whether it's government, civil society, or industry. Uh, we can look at very many resources to try to find uh, the, the best solution. And that also includes diversity of actors, whether they be uh, any of the wonderful women on this panel or uh, anyone else globally. Thank you. Thank you, Liga. Your in connection improved a lot. Uh, no. <laughs> okay, thank you to all of you. I think you gave very interesting uh, quick wins at the end, so really comprehensive, applicable to all the world, not only Europe, to our countries, but all the world. And we have to see at the end of this crisis, what will be the real intention and then and to invest, to build up this capacity, to build this inclusiveness, to consider the human sphere and the different, to address the different uh, diversity, as you said. Uh, so thank you again, all the women, and uh, and really please to continue to support Women for Cyber Initiative, uh, as as doing already in the past. In the future, we will have we will need more and more women contributing to cybersecurity. Thank you, and thank you again to the CyberSec organization. Up to you.